Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, good afternoon and uh, happy Wednesday. On today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following Article 11 property tax exemptions approved by the Council's Committee on Finance, Putnam Gardens in Councilmember Cohen's district, uh, 2997 Marion Avenue in Councilmember Cohen's district, Soundview Park Terrace, Soundview Park Townhomes in Councilmember Diaz Seniors uh, district. Apex Place Phase 1 in Councilmember Karen Kozowitz's district, Apex Place Phase 2 in Councilmember Karen Kozowitz's district, and the Council will vote on the following land use items. 270 Park Avenue, which is an application in Councilmember Keith Powers's district for a zoning text amendment to facilitate a new 70-story office building that will serve as the new headquarters for J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. This is the first site to take advantage of the East Midtown rezoning, which was passed by the council in 2017. It's gonna be a $42 million investment in the public realm following an air rights purchase from Grand Central Terminal in 2018, and there'll be the creation of 6,000 union construction jobs, side rock widenings on Madison Avenue, uh, on 47th Street, 48th Street, and on Park Avenue, $10 million for an upgraded ADA accessible subway entrance at East 47th Street, $25 million investment in full repair of the Metro North uh, train shed, and $30 million towards a new east side access entrance on West 48th Street. Uh, these, this is a big, big deal. He has spent, he spent a long, long, long time on this. It's not slated here, but do you want to say something yeah, on yeah, this? Thank, yes. Thank you. Of course. Uh, so, so as the speaker noted, we're going to be passing today a uh, text amendment for zoning that will allow J.P. Morgan to build and stay and be headquartered in East Midtown in my district. This is actually a result of work that my predecessor did with many others uh, to rezone East Midtown in 2017. As part of that deal, you have you can transfer air rights, but you have to do public ground improvements. As a result of this deal, we're getting $42 million for the city of New York to address uh, pedestrian and transit improvements right there around that site. We're keeping 14,000 14, plus jobs here in New York City, right in East Midtown, revitalizing Midtown in one big swoop. We are uh, creating 6,000 new construction jobs. We are keeping all the building service workers there and they will continue to be employed. And this is a really big deal because this is the first project that brings life to this East Midtown rezoning, which was about making Midtown a continue to be a transit rich central business hub. So this is the first project out of the gate. JP Morgan, as they were looking around where to be headquartered, said, let's do it here because of the rules that now allow them to stay and build, rebuild the headquarters. It's a really, really big deal. I want to thank the speaker and all his staff for their support along the way on this. Uh, we have, I think, many more projects as he's Midtown coming through, but this is really sort of the one that sets the precedent of going beyond what's required to do much more around transit and pedestrian improvements. So we're really excited about it. We're looking forward to, uh, to building it. And then, um, of course, keeping them here and being an anchor tenant in East Midtown. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Keith. Congratulations. We're going to vote on the following two applications in Majority Leader Lori Cumbo's district, 1050 Pacific Street rezoning. It's going to facilitate a mixed-use building with 103 units of housing, including 31 affordable units, and 1010 Pacific Street rezoning, which will facilitate the development of a mixed-use building with 124 units of housing, which 39 will be affordable units. 1640 Flatbush Avenue rezoning. Uh, it's going to enable the development of 114 units of housing in the uh, 45th Council District. The Council will be modifying the application to remove mandatory inclusionary option two and add mandatory inclusionary option one. And 1921 Atlantic Avenue, mixed-use applications that will allow for the development of a 14-story mixed-use building with 236 units of affordable housing in Council Member Alika Ampri Samuels District. And we're gonna move on to the following pieces of legislation and resolutions today. The first is resolution 828, sponsored by Councilmember Carlos Machaca, the chair of our Immigration Committee, and it commends the New York State Office of Court Administration for promulgating rules that require a judicial warrant for any civil arrest in a New York State court, and it calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign to protect our Courts Act in order to protect people from civil arrest while going to, remaining at, or returning from the place of a court proceeding. The new Office of Court Administration rules 
uh, in this bill in Albany will help keep ICE out of our courts, which is very important. Their presence in and around our courthouses breaks trust between immigrant communities and local law enforcement and courts. ICE cannot continue to interfere with New Yorkers' access to due process and public safety before the council member and the chair comes up. What we know happens right now is uh, law enforcement will let ICE know, go to this courthouse at this time, stand outside, wait outside, round them up and arrest them before their due process has ever been allowed to happen. Uh, it is uh, horrible. We've seen it happen many times, and that's why it's so important that OCA made this change and why we're supportive of the state legislature passing a bill to even strengthen what the rules that were promulgated are. So I'm going to invite uh, Chairman Chaka to come up and talk about his resolution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson. And uh, as you heard, we are moving in the right direction. The state, uh, for the first time in any state, has promulgated rules that will offer the opportunity for judicial warrant to be presented before they arrest. What this act does though, the legislative act, and this is why we're passing this resolution to let Albany know that New York City stands behind expanding this rule to a legislative fix that would actually move that barrier, not just within the courts, but around the courts, the sidewalks and the parking lot. That way we can protect not just the immigrants who are in question uh, by ICE, but all the people who are there to support immigrants in our courts. We've seen a rise in 1,700% of, of ICE activity in our courts. That's, this, is, this is part of the deportation machine. This is part of Trump's administration trying to remove uh, people of color, immigrants from our cities to whiten America, and we're saying no. Uh, and it's just great that we can do that here at the city council. Uh, there's more to do, uh, but we wanna make sure that we send a very loud uh, voice. The state senate and the assembly will be pushing this and hopefully the governor will sign uh, before June. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Carlos. Uh, next is uh, introduction 562, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Traeger, and it will require that owners of multiple dwellings post notice in a common area stating the relevant hurricane evacuation zone number for that building and providing information on the presence of evacuation centers in that area and in that borough. And I wanna invite uh, Councilmember Traeger up to speak on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Speaker Johnson and my colleagues for moving Intro 562 forward uh, for a vote before the Council at today's stated meeting. This vital piece of legislation is coming forward at a critical time as our planet is warming at a record speed, creating unpredictable and inclement weather patterns leading to an increase in natural disasters. We learned from the city's response to Superstorm Sandy that critical information like how, when, and where to evacuate to never trickled down to the most vulnerable communities at the front lines of the storm's devastation. During Sandy, my district, along with many other coastal neighborhoods throughout the city, uh, did not have adequate access to information about evacuation procedures, when to go, where to go, how to get there, or where the ne nearest emergency uh, center was located. Um, uh, matter of fact, according to the city's health department, only 37% of residents in Zone A evacuated during the mandatory evacuation. My legislation, and by the way, folks were stranded in high-rise buildings for days without power and, and access to key utilities. My legislation is a direct response to those painful lessons learned, will help close a dangerous communication gap between government and residents. As the impact and threat of climate change grows, we must ensure all New Yorkers have access to this kind of critical, life-saving information. Um, emergency preparedness uh, is key to planning for future unexpected events and my bill expands on the safety measures necessary to facilitate safe evacuation should another natural disaster occur uh, intro 5662 uh, uh, will help bring us a step closer to, to this obje objective by mandating that apartment buildings will be required uh, to post hurricane evacuation and shelter information and have it available all year round not just during or before, right before a natural disaster, but all year round, so folks have adequate time to plan to prepare. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, congratulations, Mark. Um, introduction 1533, uh, sponsored by our public advocate, Jumani Williams, would extend the June 1st, 2019 compliance deadline by which workers and supervisors must obtain a portion of the training required by local law 196 of 2017 to December 1st, 2019 and allows the Department of Buildings to further extend that deadline by another six months if necessary. 
Councilmember Chaka, I know, worked on this with Councilmember Williams, uh, with Public Advocate Williams, I apologize. And Public Advocate Williams is unable to join us today, but I want to thank him for his work on this issue uh, with Councilmember Menchaca. The next package of bills uh, is really near and dear to my heart. I got my start advocating uh, uh, in, in uh, community organizing on housing issues, and I'm very proud that we're taking this action today to protect tenants. Uh, all too often, landlords are using unscrupulous methods to get people out of their apartments to try to increase or unlock the value of those buildings. That's what happens when you have vacancy decontrol, which incentivizes landlords to do all sorts of things to um, get a par uh, get an apartment out of rent stabilization. Uh, these methods, which the New York Times exposed in a really detailed and meticulous series last May, include construction as harassment, taking advantage of lax enforcement of laws meant to protect tenants, <coughs> landlords lying about the existence of tenants on construction documents, landlords making unfair buyout offers to tenants, and a lack of due process in housing court proceedings. Today, we are doing something about this, building upon the council's work last session, before I was speaker, to address tenant harassment. The council is passing 17 pieces of legislation that addresses these unscrupulous methods and finally holds unscrupulous landlords accountable. The first three bills we're voting on are by Council Member Rosenthal, who has worked on these issues for a very long time. I'm gonna go through these bills and then call her up. Introduction uh, 1279 will require the Department of Buildings and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to verify that building owners are correcting dangerous building and housing maintenance code violations. Introduction 1280 will require that the construction permit applications contain a statement signed by the owner and applicant identifying any occupied units in the building. The bill would also establish specific civil and criminal penalties for lying on these forms to obtain a building permit. And introduction 1107, when a building owner wants to do a major construction in a building with residential tenants, the owner must submit a tenant protection plan with the building permit application. This bill would shift the responsibility of retaining a design professional to prepare a tenant protection plan from building owners to contractors. And it will require statements by building owners and contractors regarding the occupancy of a building and the scope of work of a construction project. I want to invite Councilman Rosenthal up to discuss her three bills. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you, Speaker, for all your hard work. Uh, as you and I have said over and over again, we are losing our affordable housing, our rent-regulated apartments hand over fist. There's nothing more important than saving the affordable housing we have and keeping people in their homes. Construction as a form of tenant harassment puts tenant safety at risk, all tenants who live in the building, and contributes to our loss of affordable housing. Why my three bills are so necessary can be illustrated in the following two examples. At 97-99 Clay Street in Brooklyn, housing advocates report that tenants in 21 of the 25 apartments have been pushed out through sustained, untenable demolition and construction conditions. The four building rent stabilized Sorry, the four-story rent-stabilized property was sold to developers in 2014. One of the tenants who refused to take a buyout was told that if she didn't leave, construction would make her life a living hell. In order to get construction permits without having to file a tenant protection plan or TPP, the landlord lied to the city and stated that the building was not occupied and the apartments not rent regulated. After the landlord finally came clean and filed a tenant protection plan, the Department of Buildings discovered that the plan had never been posted for the tenants to see. The DOB also found that the landlord failed to comply with the TPP and the tenant protection plan was incomplete and shouldn't have been accepted in the first place. Even worse, the landlord falsely self-certified that he had corrected a violation for removal of fire prevention material from a first floor hallway. The violation, the violation was reissued 
four months later, and there's no indication that the city was aware of the false certification in the first place. Similarly, there's a building in my district, South Pierre on West 71st Street. They have lost two thirds of the 300 rent stabilized apartments since 2007. The exodus of the tenants was driven by massive construction projects. Construction projects where uh, the, the building owner got permits over and over and over again for the exact same work and jackhammering continued endlessly for the exact same work four years running. Um, so these are just samples of the malicious actions taken to displace tenants. It's beyond acceptable, unacceptable, and the bill package, uh, including my three, will help keep people in their homes. I wanna thank all of the tenant and tenant organizers who have fought so hard to protect their rights, to Speaker Corey Johnson and Chair Carnegie, as well as the Committee on Housing and Building staff, Austin Branford, um, Janan Sakiha, Megan Chen, Bradley Reed, Audrey Sun, and to all my staff, Sarah Queen and Ned Terrace. Thank you so much, Speaker, for thank the package. You. No, no, thank you, Helen. Appreciate Congratulations. It. And I also want to thank the staff who's in the room. They do an amazing job. They worked very, really hard on this package of bills. Uh, so I want to thank them for their incredible work on this. Next, we're going to vote an introduction, 1242, sponsored by Councilmember Diana Ayala, Diana Ayala, which would expand the Department of Housing Preservation and Development's online property owner registry by requiring inclusion of Department of Building violations related to construction has harassment, including violations of work without a permit and work in violation of a stop work order. It would also require HPD to include rent overcharge information from the state and incorporate that information into the registry if that information becomes available to HPD from the state. Uh, Councilman Royale is not here, but this is a really important bill. I congratulate her. We're going to vote on two pieces of legislation by Councilmember Alika Ampri Samuel, Introduction 1277, which will require the Department of Buildings to perform preliminary inspections to verify the occupancy status of a building when an owner claims on a building application that the building is unoccupied. In Introduction 1241, currently under DOB's professional certification program, design professional may sign off on building permit applications without review by DOB. This bill would expand liability for false professional certifications to the offending registered design professional supervisor as well as the professional personally. Uh, Councilmember Ampri Samuel is not here, but I want to congratulate her. Introduction 1278, sponsored by Councilmember Carlina Rivera, will require the Department of Buildings to approve tenant protection plans prior to construction and to periodically inspect construction sites to ensure compliance with the plan. Council Rivera is not here, but I congratulate her. And introduction 1275, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, will deny construction permits for one year for a building following a determination that a false statement about the occupancy status was made on a construction application for that building or following a determination that work was conducted without a permit while such building was occupied. And I want to invite Councilmember Powers up to discuss this bill. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, thank, thank you for this legislation package, first of all. Uh, this is really important. Um, it, it took, you know, in addition to the conversation happening in Albany right now around rent regulation and housing, what the city is doing is really going to the ground level of uh, affordability and rent regulation and tenant protection today. My bill is, I call the lying landlords bill. We're putting lying landlords on notice that if you lie about occupancy in your building, you can't get a permit until you rectify that situation. It's a one year moratorium for anybody that is lying about occupancy, which we have seen has been reported on, is a way to deregulate a, a building to get people out, and it undercuts the strength, the strengthening the rent regulation stuff that we're trying to get done in Albany. So I'm really thankful to all the staff here. Thank you to the speaker, and thank you to all my colleagues who worked on this. I represent so many rent regulated tenants in uh, New York City and Manhattan in a really high priced part of Manhattan, and this is gonna make sure that they are not viewed as expendable and uh, expendable tenants that they need to kick out to uh, create new luxury housing. This is really important. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing our bill passed today. Thanks. Congratulations. 
Uh, next, we're going to vote on uh, three bills by Councilmember Cornegie. Introduction 1258. Uh, the only way currently for a tenant to know when they are being evicted is if they're served with court papers. This is a basic due process right for anyone being sued. Unfortunately, we heard from many reports of tenants and the New York Times uh, series uh, really got to the nitty gritty on this, that tenants are not being notified when a landlord starts an eviction proceeding against them. This bill would require that the Department of Consumer Affairs annually audit the records of at least 20% of licensed process servers who serve notices for housing court proceedings. This bill would further require that DCA post on its website and notify process serving agencies when a process server has been disciplined or when the process server's license has been suspended, revoked, or the license renewal is denied. Introduction 59, owners often uh, try to persuade tenants into vacating their units by offering them a sum of money, a practice known as a buyout offer. This bill requires that landlords offering buyouts to tenants disclose that there is no guarantee that the tenant will find a similar apartment in the same community district with the same number of bedrooms for the same rent that the tenant is currently paying and that additional factors may impact their ability to obtain other housing. And introduction 1257 will require that the Department of Buildings to issue a stop work order if any inspector is unable to gain access to a construction site and has reason to believe that work is being done in violation uh, of the law. Councilmember Cornegie is not able to be with us uh, today, but I want to congratulate him and I want to uh, call up um, Councilmember Amprey Samuel to speak on introductions 1277 and 1241, two bills that she's passing today. Good afternoon, everyone. This is just in a nutshell and just really keeping it simple. For me, it's about being there to be able to protect New Yorkers. In any possible way, as a council body, we're supposed to work on bills that deal with transparency and accountability. And both 1277 and 1241 speaks directly to holding architects and engineers accountable. When they present documents to the city of New York, they should make sure that what they are submitting is accurate. Because when there's something that's false, that has a direct impact on people. And so for me, I try to keep things as simple as possible. And again, that's protecting everyday New Yorkers from harassment of landlords, harassment of developers, and just harassment when it's time for them to be in their homes and when there's falsified documents and they're living in their buildings and construction is being done, that is something that we cannot tolerate and we should not tolerate. So again, 1277 and 1241 is really about transparency and accountability and protecting everyday tenants and New Yorkers. Congratulations. <clears throat> Next up is <clears throat> uh, introduction 1247, sponsored by Council Member Fernando Cabrera, and it will require that owners of residential buildings provide copies of any notice of violation issued against a property to the residents of that property. Additionally, the Department of Buildings must create a pamphlet or flyer explaining the adjudication process for such violations to be distributed with copies of notices of violations so tenants can participate in the adjudication process. Councilmember Cabrera can't be here, but I congratulate him on his bill. Introduction 977, sponsored by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, will uh, permit the Department of Buildings to sanction registered design professionals if a professionally certified application that is submitted to DOB contains an error that results in a stop work order. It will require that DOB maintain a database of registered design professionals who have been excluded, suspended, or otherwise sanctioned by DOE. And I want to call Antonio up on his bill. Okay. Uh, and I just want to state that we had uh, construction as harassment bills that we passed in our last term, and it just shows how creative people are when it comes to trying to get uh, their tenants out of rent-stabilized apartments. And I'm glad that uh, Speaker Corey Johnson uh, didn't stop there and didn't think that that was enough and decided to move forward with these types of bills. Uh, my bill is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to make sure that if you do something wrong, uh, that everyone knows about it. If you are a design professional who's falsified documents or made uh, significant errors, everyone's going to know that you did that. Um, it'll hurt your ability to m maintain clients. I would encourage people or incentivize them to not be on that list so that they can, uh, so they can be hired. So uh, 
in New York City, we currently allow professionals to self-certify. Um, so this is in the cases where these self-certifications um, are not necessarily uh, uh, being done honestly. So thank you to uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for these bills. Congrats, Antonio. Congrats. Uh, next, uh, introduction 1171, sponsored by Councilman Richie Torres, will require the Department of Buildings to obtain information from the Department of Finance and the state in order to identify cases of false statements regarding occupied or rent-regulated housing. Several audits are also required by this bill. DOB will be required to conduct an audit of an owner's entire portfolio of properties if the owner has been caught either failing to obtain a building permit or submitting false statements regarding occupied or rent-regulated housing on an application for a building permit. DOB would also be required to audit 25% of the buildings in the Department of Housing Preservation uh, speculation watch list for compliance with building permit requirements on an annual basis and, that, and to audit all buildings owned by landlords who have submitted an unusually high number of amended building permits. If DOB finds that an owner has made a false statement, DOB must notify the City Council, the Department of Investigation, the Division of Housing, Community and Renewal, a state agency, and the Tenant Protection Unit, which is part of DHCR. Uh, D yeah, DHCR and the Attorney General for potential criminal prosecution and the relevant district attorney and report on punitive actions uh, if it took, uh, 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 punitive actions it took in every case in which it found evidence of a falsified application for a building permit. Councilor Torres is unable to join us, but this is a really important bill as well. Introduction 975, sponsored by Council Member Justin Brannon, will require the Department of Buildings to deny construction permits for buildings with a significant number of open, dangerous building and housing maintenance code violations. The law would allow for permits for work to correct the violations or for emergency work. Councilmember Brand is not with us. I want to congratulate him. And finally, two bills by Councilmember Mark Levine. Introduction 1274 will require owners on multiple owners of multiple dwellings to provide tenants with the previous four years of rent history from the state. This is really important. We're available for their apartment in introduction 551, which would require that where owners enter into buyout agreements with their tenants, the owners must submit certain information about the terms of that agreement to uh, HPD within 90 days of execution, and I invite Councilmember Levine up on these two bills. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and as Councilmember Reynoso said, it's really important that we're moving this package. We're, of course, fighting tooth and nail to improve the rent laws, to fix the rent laws up in Albany, but I'm really proud we're using our leverage here in the city to rein in some of the worst behavior by landlords. And uh, one of the great flaws of our rent law system is that there's almost no proactive enforcement. We rely on tenants to report bad behavior, including in one of the most egregious things a landlord can do, which is overcharging above the legally um, allowed rent in a regulated apartment. And the only way a tenant can catch this is if they know the rent history when they move in. And an informed tenant would know how to um, request and receive that information. But most tenants don't. Our law fixes that. Intro 1274 would require that landlords provide four years of rent history to tenants when they move in so that they can spot illegally overcharging of rent um, and report it. This is uh, putting the power of information in the hands of tenants uh, to shine a light on this kind of bad behavior. Uh, secondly, I'm pleased to be lead sponsor on Intro 551. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal described uh, the kind of typical scenario that tenants find themselves in when they are offered buyouts. Often it's when they're under threat, when they're fearful of an eviction proceeding or their life will be made miserable by construction. And of course, then they take paltry buyouts at sums which will never allow them to replace their housing, $5,000, $10,000. Um, until now, this practice, which is rampant, has existed entirely in the shadows. We have no idea just um, how many of these offers are being made and accepted and what the amounts are and where they're being offered. And this bill would finally give us that information by requiring landlords to report every time they um, make a buyout, to report on the location, the amount, um, and then to, for the city to report in aggregate um, what those numbers are so we as policymakers can track this trend uh, and, and rein in this kind of bad behavior. 
Thank you again, Speaker Johnson, for pushing this important package forward. Congrats, Mark. Uh, yesterday, I was in Albany um, with uh, tenants from across New York City for Tenant Tuesday, which is happening every Tuesday up in Albany for the rest of the legislative session because of the expiration of the rent laws. I met with uh, Speaker Hasty. I met with Chair Simberwitz, the chair of the Housing Committee in the Assembly. And I met with Majority Leader Stuart Cousins, and all three of those meetings were not just me, but they were tenants from New York City. There were a bunch of tenants from Sunset Park who were amazing, um, and tenants from uh, all five boroughs that were up uh, lobbying on the renewal and the strengthening of the rent laws. And so we are very limited, sadly, because of the Erstat law uh, and because of vacancy decontrol and making significant changes in protecting rent regulated units. And so the bills that you see today, uh, as Councilmember Reynoso just said, are an additional creative approach to try to protect tenants in the best way possible. But the really seismic thing that could happen is the strengthening of our rent laws, repealing vacancy decontrol. My position is eliminating MCIs and IAIs, uh, getting rid of the vacancy bonus, uh, putting in place a good cause eviction legislation. There's about nine bills in the Assembly and the Senate which would really strengthen our rent laws. Uh, and this, we have a housing crisis, we have a homelessness crisis, and we need to protect as many tenants as possible. You see it every single day. 23,000 children are homeless in the city of New York tonight, sleeping in our shelter system. And we have to protect our rent laws. It's the most important thing we can do over the next six weeks. This package of bills seeks to complement what's happening at the state level. And hopefully these two things, state action and the city action today, will give tenants an even better fighting chance moving forward. Uh, that is all on uh, today's bills. We look forward to proceeding with votes, and I'm happy to take first any on-topic questions on anything in this package. You know, I'm disappointed that I think that there wasn't um, uh, the highest level of engagement and trying to move in a rapid way from the Department of Buildings and from small business services that were charged with uh, putting the information together. Councilman Chaka knows about this. He worked on this very, very hard for a long time. Happy to have him speak on it as well. Uh, and so, you know, you have people who are actually, we've seen uh, many construction deaths. Rosa Goldenson from the city has done amazing reporting, both when she was at Cranes and now at the city on the importance of protecting construction workers. And we passed this bill in the previous session to do just that. So to not see the training component done and the services rendered and the certifications up and running uh, in a rapid time frame is disappointing. At the same time, we don't want to be shutting down work sites right now across the city and putting people out of work. So this is a balance that we're trying to strike. We move forward because the public advocate and Councilman Chaka thought this was the most prudent, effective, thoughtful way to move forward given the dynamics we've seen between DOB, SBS, and the city council, and that's what's happening right now. We need to continue to protect uh, construction workers, especially day laborers, who are sort of the most exploited people on work sites and are dealing with some of the most dangerous conditions, and that's what we're trying to do. But I'm happy to have Carlos speak on this because he spent so much time on this. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. I, I think the, the things that, that I want to lay out, and really this is in addition to what the Speaker said, is that we now have time to look back and see how this bill has manifested. The time that we need is another six months, with DOB given the other, another opportunity to extend it for another six months. Uh, the pressure points are good. We need to put a pressure point to ensure that everyone gets trained. The coalition that came together included, really for the first time ever, the day laborers, immigrant community members that we're connected to right now, and they're telling us a couple things. One is that the June 1 deadline is causing issues around fake OSHA cards. Um, that's problematic because people are rushing to get people cards. What isn't happening right now, and this is because the administration and we're trying to all work together, um, the leadership has changed at the DOB. We just got a new uh, uh, commissioner coming on soon in June. Uh, and so they need to refocus. And so we're hoping that we can all refocus and ensure that the pipelines for access to these training modules happen quickly and that the resources are there. That's how we're gonna get there. And I think the six months is gonna give us that opportunity. Um, yeah, Jeff. Uh, 
this isn't this is this is a hard nut to crack. Uh, you have you have an incredible workforce that is immigrant, mostly immigrant. The day laborers, the people who are dying, are immigrants, Latinos, uh, who have language access issues. This is this is a hard thing to figure out. But we have more information now that we did when we passed the bill last session. And so that's what we're taking into consideration to ensure that we get the right resources, we get the right people in the in the in the room, uh, and that we can allow for um, more enforcement on. The, Look at all the bills that we just passed here on landlords. We've got to do the same thing on construction work, work and contractors. And so we're thinking about enforcement as well, and more stuff will come soon. Well, that's part of the that's part of the, the situation too. So we are. Uh, and the numbers that we're getting right now is about 150,000 workers that need to get trained. Uh, curriculum had just been developed a, fo a couple months ago, so the unions are just revving up as well, but they're more resource than we have uh, going to the day laborers. And so we need to kind of equalize all of that. Um, and so when you have almost 200,000 workers that need to get trained, we, we're hoping that in six months we can get the engine running for education and access in our neighborhoods, in people's languages. Uh, and again, more information will come to soon, but removing that deadline for June 1st is going to give us that breathing room to focus, and the new commissioner coming in, uh, I know her personally, um, she's going to she's gonna be great. She's, she's going to be great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with uh, the incoming commissioner, Commissioner LaRocca, Melanie LaRocca. I'm really, I think it was a great appointment by the mayor, and uh, looking forward to working with her on this, and I know she'll take this really seriously. I mean, what the message that I also want to put out there on this is that this should not be an excuse for people to delay their training and certification. If they can currently get into uh, trainings, we want people to get in and not to wait. And we want people, many people as possible, but because the workforce is so large and it took a long time to get the curriculum up and going and DOB wasn't giving certifications out and small business services wasn't approving the contracts, it created this log jam that we then were trying to figure out a responsible path forward. And this is what the public advocate and Councilman Machaca were working on given their history on this bill. Uh, Yoav? I want to get a better sense from the incoming commissioner about what she thinks her needs are, but I do think they likely need more staff. I mean, Councilman Rosenthal passed a really important bill which predates this package, which was creating the Office of the Tenant Advocate, and the mayor signed the, the, mayor signed the bill into law. So the mayor signed the bill into law. Did he have a signing ceremony? Uh, it was a big one. He had a big signing ceremony. And two years ago, two, years summers ago, ago. two summers ago, and the positions aren't filled, even though he signed it into law. So they're violating a law that he signed at DOB, which is to do a lot of the stuff that to implement all of these laws. All these laws. So to have someone there that could be a resource for tenants and dedicated to that. So, I mean, they're saying I think the original idea, Helen, was three, three people. Right. Well, no, the uh, the original bill had two up here had the two FTEs in it. It's finally. Uh, and there's one guy there who was doing two jobs, his, his usual job and the office of the tenant advocate. And then I think he's on board there permanently now. And then they're looking for a second position. The truth of the matter is, if you look at, for example, the Office of Special Enforcement and the work they do, when we came into office in 2013, there were what, like 12 or mm -hmm. less. less. There were less than a dozen people there and they couldn't really do their job of getting rid of illegal hotels. The mayor's recognized that now. It's up to over two dozen people who work in that office. It's taken seriously, and they're getting the job done. They're bringing cases against these um, building owners for illegal hotels. Um, who, who it's the same sort of very, very slow start with the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Now at least we have the guy who's filling the job recognizes now how important that office is. Um, now we need to beef up the staffing so they can really do their job. And I, I mean, I think that uh, I have to get a better sense from the new commissioner on what she thinks the needs are for implementing these bills. But um, again, I think in the past, what 
local residents and neighborhoods, what community boards, what tenant associations, what community leaders would tell, I think, every yeah. single one of us is that DOB is a place that isn't responsive to residents. DOB is a place where permits get rubber stamped, it's very dysfunctional, and that they don't have the technology and processes set up to be able to handle these things in a systematic way, which is why we are implementing all this. I also want to understand what they need from a technology basis as well, because a lot of this could be refined through updated technology. Luis? Tell me, is it? No, no. Yeah, yeah okay, I thought so. I said Luis, and then you turned around, so I wasn't sure if there was. Um, on that same note, a lot of utilities found their enforcement responsibilities with DOB. What sort of pushback did you get from them to City Hall to make you and your builder intervene? And First chat. Are they totally on board right now? I mean, they're on board. Um, this was a package that we had to negotiate for a while, and I think we had to negotiate it not because they were philosophically opposed to any of these bills, but it, some of this stuff is very, very technical. It's technical when you talk about uh, professionally certified folks. It's technical when you talk about uh, building violations and what the exact violation is. These are very, very technical matters. Um, and again, it, it ha it's gonna shift the way DOB has to not just think about these things, but how they process it and how they handle it. So there wasn't, I think, pushback on the enforcement aspect. There was more negotiation, an extended negotiation over the technicalities of each bill. And throughout the process of these 17 bills, which again came out of a New York Times series that was done by Kim Barker and her team last May, the administration uh, didn't seem opposed to any of these bills to my understanding. Yeah, yeah, please. If I could just add one more point to it. A couple of the bills add, you, you heard from everyone reporting on their bills, add responsibility for tenant protection plan or the site safety plan, whatever it is, to the owner themselves and to the, cons to the contractor. So now the responsibility is spread around and no one can make an excuse. That doesn't take any more staff. <laughs> so, uh, my counsel just told me that DOB did flag some concerns related to having the necessary resources, which goes to Yov's question, the necessary resources on the auditing aspect. If we're going to require additional auditing of a higher percentage of buildings, they likely can't do that with the current staff that they have. They're going to need additional staff to do that work. Any other questions on topic? Will? No, I mean, we're in the middle of the budget process, so we'll, we'll talk to DOB and OMB about what the particular needs are um, for this, and, and that's a conversation we'll engage in. Any other questions on topic? Off topic. I'm not gonna remember all the council members who have been leaders on this. I do remember Councilmember Van Bramer has taken a lead on hit and run uh, legislation in the past and it's a huge concern. Um, you know, I've been pushing, uh, deepening our commitment to Vision Zero. Councilmember Reynoso, who just left, uh, coined the term that I've tried to amplify, which is breaking the car culture in New York City and protecting uh, pedestrians and cyclists. And it's disturbing that only 9% of people who have engaged in uh, hit and runs are, are being caught. One of the things we've called on is beefing up the investigation, the, the, the collision investigation squad. I might be getting the, yeah. The collision investigation squad is part of the NYPD, um, which really goes to the heart of this question, which is following up in incidents like this and getting, uh, catching people that are dangerous drivers and are putting the public at risk. And we'll continue to call on the NYPD throughout this budget process to beef up that unit, to give them more personnel to do this work in a bigger way. Joe? Uh, 
Um, I'm not being, I'm just saying, I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I can tell you what I do know, which is that everything that Chair Matteo outlined last week um, as part of the standards and ethics meeting is what has been investigated. And I think Chair Matteo was very specific about the many aspects of this investigation. And I think it's disturbing, of course. Uh, we have due process here, so it will continue to go through the procedures that exist. Um, but again, I think it's none of this is personal to any members of the city council, but we have to be held to a higher standard. And when we get um, complaints or things are flagged um, to the general counsel's office, to the chair of that committee, um, Minority Leader Matteo, to myself or anyone else, we send it to that committee and we do a full investigation. That's what we've done on every matter that's come up in the last year and a half that I've been speaker, and we're gonna to continue to do that. Rich? We were there. First time. And we had a great time. <laughs> I am still, I am still shaking over meeting Sansa Stark, Sophie Turner, <laughs> because I am like, I am, you know, the North remembers. I am, I am House Stark. So, um, it, it, it was like, Helen was there. It was, it was, it was one of the most remarkable nights because Cher's performing and I'm obsessed with Lady Gaga and um, it, it was an amazing night. So um, I, I thought it was great. I think actually one of the best parts of, we're the greatest city in the world. And one of the reasons why the greatest city in the world is because we are the cultural capital of the world. We have the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is one of the most important museums in the entire world. We are the fashion capital of the world, every type of fashion. And that event, of course, is an event that very, very few people get to attend, which is why we are honored that we were able to go to represent the city of New York, uh, not because of our fashion tastes. Um, but, you know, I think I, 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 not you, me. Sorry, I mean, Helen was camp, I was tux uh, at the event. Um, you threw him off my train of thought. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, Part of, the part, of the part of the job, I think, being council speaker and being mayor and being a council member who represents the Met, which Councilman Rosenthal does, and being controller or public advocate or any position in the city, is sometimes you have to go and be a cheerleader on behalf of the city. Sure. You, have to, you have to go and celebrate the city of New York, and, and that's why I was proud to do it. I thought it was a fabulous event. I had an amazing time. I was honored to be there. And if the mayor has not been to the Met Gala before, uh, he should come next year because it really is a celebration of art and culture and fashion in New York City. I live in a 319 square foot studio apartment. <laughs> the mayor, I think, owns two brownstones and lives in Gracie Mansion, which he's allowed to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. But like, you know, before I was elected Speaker of the Council, I owned one suit. So I don't consider myself to be an elitist. Um, I consider myself to be someone who loves the city of New York. We're the greatest city in the world. I'm gonna be a cheerleader and a booster and an advocate for our city, and going to the Met is about that. I mean, I, you know, never dreamt that I'd be invited to the, to the, to the Met Gala, and it was an honor to be there. You're welcome.
I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. You, when you say go to an outside entity, you're talking about the fact that we've hired folks to do sort of a forensic audit of our own practices. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I believe we explained this to you when you were writing your story, and, um, and I think we were pretty clear about this. We believe in the EEPC's work, and we've voluntarily agreed to, to work with them. Uh, but the issue here is not about sexual harassment. The issue here is about separation of powers. And the EEPC has oversight over executive agencies, both mayoral agencies and other non-mayoral executive agencies. And as the separate branch of government, we feel like it's important that we maintain a level of independence. And the way we're doing that is we have hired very, very serious, seasoned, skilled uh, outside professionals that do this work in a very serious way. We, uh, as we explained for your piece, we adopted a rule which totally matched the legislation as part of the sexual harassment package of bills that we adopted last February. So we're not holding ourselves to a different standard. This jurisdictional fight dates back um, 13 years or 14 years. It predates my time. It goes back two or three speakers. Um, and again, because we have the separation of powers uh, disagreement, which goes beyond auditing and sexual harassment, it's just a separation of powers issue, we agreed to voluntarily work with this body, yep. give them information to show that we're serious about it, while at the same exact time saying there is a separation of powers uh, concern here, and that's why we are uh, going in this way. And again, you know, uh, I am very, very, very proud of the work we've done. Very, very, very proud. I'm proud of how I've handled yep. instances here. I'm proud of the package of bills. I'm really proud of Helen Rosenthal for her leadership. And this is not an issue of sexual harassment, which I've tried to explain to you multiple times. This is an issue of separation of powers. So um, I feel like this is a muddying of waters on a separation of powers issue uh, by throwing this issue in when it's not about that. And I think I've been very clear about that. S Summer? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know enough about how it works, so I don't want to answer that question without understanding from the general counsel's office how we do that. We, uh, as Yoav reported in his piece, we uh, posted the information that we were required to by the date we were required to uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, we did that. That was the requirement. Um, we have done a significant amount. We had a training this morning for council members on sexual harassment. Uh, and we are constantly out there training the staff and doing more for the staff and putting more resources into this area as well. So I would have to learn more about what the requirements are before answering that question, not in an evasive way, but again, this is a separation of powers issue. And I wanna understand what that means and if there are any implications on that. Yes. I think that there's still education that needs to be done, um, and I look forward to engaging in the conversations around uh, education on the bill that we've proposed. Uh, there is, of course, a religious exemption uh, to the bill, and I still have the fundamental belief that um, this is a luxury product. Uh, there are other alternatives, like faux fur, or other materials that can be used. Uh, Donna Karen and Diane von Furstenberg and Michael Kors and name the major fashion designers. They have gotten rid of fur because they've said that when they've learned about it, it is cruel and inhumane to trap animals, to farm animals, to raise animals just for the purpose of wearing them on your body, not for the purpose of feeding people who might be hungry. Uh, this is a totally different issue. And so uh, I'm really proud. You know, I think there are a lot of people who support this bill. Um, uh, Colin Kaepernick is someone that's been against uh, uh, wearing fur. Uh, Wendy Williams has spoken out. 
against uh, trying to get rid of fur and supporting bills in the past. Angela Davis is someone who supported this. So I think there are probably people in the African American community who, who are against the bill. There are some who support it. There are people in every community who are against the bill and some who support it. I think there needs to be a further education campaign on what this means. We're not gonna tell people they can't wear fur in public. We're not taking anyone's fur away. We're saying that you should transition to a more ethical and humane product. And I believe that that's achievable, that we can do that. Los Angeles did it, San Francisco did it, West Hollywood did it, London, which is one of the four largest uh, fashion weeks in the world. You have New York, London, Milan, and Paris. London just banned fur from being shown at Fashion Week in London because of how cruel it is. I think I need to probably do a better job of getting these facts out there, having a conversation about it, and ensuring that some of the folks who are uh, some of the industry leaders who are opposed to this aren't able to scare people and spread misinformation. I think there's a way to transition these businesses away from just using fur products to other more ethical products in fashion, which every major fashion designer has done around the world without it hurting their businesses. And I think we can do that here in New York City and be a global leader. Will. No, leather's different. The reason why leather's different is because leather is a co-product of, uh, of, of meat. So right now, if you're killing a mink or a chinchilla or a coyote for fur, you're not using their meat. You're literally, no, no, you're not. That's a fact. You're not. These are luxury products with certain animals that they are being skinned alive, gassed, trapped, farmed for fur just to take the fur off their body to wear on clothes. That's not what happens with leather. Leather, if you uh, slaughter an animal for meat purposes, you use the co-product, their skin, for a fashion purpose as well. There's a very big distinction between doing that and using fur. That's the big difference between the two. And, and I have no problem with leather because I think it's already being used for uh, feeding of people, so there's an ethical way to do it. Anyone else? Rich. The president is uh, a sociopath who doesn't care about the rule of law, who's a racist, who is an autocrat, who is someone who does not believe the rules apply uh, to him, who has tried to topple uh, democratic pillars of society, who has threatened the, pre the free press, who has instigated violence, who has sympathized with white nationalists, who has evaded the law, who has not paid his taxes. The president is a career criminal. So I don't really take anything serious of what the president says, because on a daily basis, sadly, our country has to live with his total dissembling and his immorality and uh, that is why this upcoming election is so key. That is why we need an independent judiciary to, uh, to ensure that he's not uh, able to get away with this. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that even though he's saying that his administration will not comply with any of the subpoenas that are being voted on by the different committees of the House of Representatives, whether it's the Judiciary Committee by Chair Nadler or the House Investi the, the Government Oversight Committee by Chair Cummings, there's gonna be a judicial showdown. And we're gonna see if there really are co-equal branches of government as the United States Constitution has laid out. It's gonna be really, really important. Some of this is a distraction. It's a distraction in the way that he doesn't wanna focus on his failures in other areas. So it's a way to, I think, keep that out of the press. But it's still important for the future of our country, for the rule of law, for the sacred nature of our US Constitution. And that's what I think about Donald Trump. who I believe really should run for president. I mean, I don't know currently if she lives in LA or New York, but I love Lady Gaga. <laughs> okay, that's the end of this press conference, goodbye. <laughs>